Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Prime Minister Theresa May formally began Britain's divorce from the European Union on Wednesday, declaring there was no turning back. In one of the most significant steps by a British leader since World War II, May notified EU Council President Donald Tusk in a hand-delivered letter that Britain would quit the bloc it joined in 1973. Unlike last year, however, when in a referendum the UK voted to exit the EU, which created panic in the Indian markets, Theresa May triggering Article 50 did not rankle the Indian bosses much. While it is still early days to gauge its real effect, or rather gauge its real effect, Indian companies and sectors such as auto, metals, IT and tours and travel that have a notable exposure to the region are likely to see some impact in the days to come. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse what's in store for India now that there's no turning back on Brexit. Joining me on the programme today are Meera Shankar, former diplomat, SK Sarkar, managing committee member, SO Cham, Abhijit Das, Head Centre for WTO Studies, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and Priya Ranjan Dash, Senior Journalist. Thank you so much for joining me on uh, The Big Picture today. Ambassador, I'd like to begin with you, of course, and ask you, does India need to be concerned about Brexit? Well, um, you know, it does weaken the European Union at one level. And I think it also reflects a kind of uh, anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner sentiment which is sweeping across Europe and America. Uh, the f much will depend on the terms that are negotiated under Brexit because this notification by uh, Prime Minister Theresa May just kicks off the process which is likely to take at least two years. Uh, so what the terms of the exit are going to be will uh, uh, impact uh, how uh, we see it. Uh, but clearly there are companies which are already looking at hedging their bets because um, Britain was a financial center. It was a center for manufacturing pharmaceuticals and so on. Uh, and easy access to the European market was clearly one of the reasons that enabled London uh, to emerge as such a flourishing uh, center for trade and investment. Now many companies are looking to set up, they're hedging their bets, they're looking to set up establishments and particularly the financial companies in Frankfurt or Paris in addition to London because, uh, you know, two years down the road, it may not be so easy for them to access the European market. Uh, in India, we have quite a number of companies uh, which have invested in the UK, the Tatas being amongst the biggest, both in the steel sector as well as in the automobile sector. So they would uh, obviously uh, keep an eye out for how the final deal is going to impact their investments sure. in the region. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Dash, you know, as far as the markets were concerned, last year we saw them uh, reacting adversely to the referendum on the vote to, uh, to come out of Europe as far as Britain was concerned. But this time around, when Article 50 was triggered, it didn't seem to have affected the market so much here in India. You see, uh, there is, uh, you can see there is an irony to the situation uh, that uh, at a time when India is uh, moving towards the goal of a common market, and uh, in India, this has been in making for 17 years. Uh, and after you had the uh, European Union integration and the Euro, uh, you know, at the, at the turn of the century. So, uh, and for the Indian common market goal, including uh, GST, uh, for which Europe, the single market, uh, has been a source of inspiration, I would say. When that is happening in India, that is the common market is actually taking shape, uh, Europe uh, uh, seems to be disintegrating and uh, uh, Britain is getting out of uh, the, the European Union. The process has begun. Now, as we know, 
uh, the exit would take place uh, only after two years. Now, um, uh, so in terms of and and the vote to exit happened nine ten months ago. Now, given that situation, the markets uh, won't won't be reacting knee jerk to this kind of a development. And uh, as you know, the the market move with a combination of factors. And the irony of this situation clearly uh, had something to you know this this contrasting. Uh, thing that you have the domestic integration of the common market in India taking shape that uh, had clearly a positive impact though there are fears and apprehensions about the Brexit uh, process taking off. So, uh, so that, that was you know multiple factors uh, neutralizing so not a very clear trend you could uh, see from the, um, uh, fr from the market movement. But uh, the, the, uh, there is clearly about, uh, about Britain exiting, um, uh, exiting uh, U European Union, uh, the, the, there are both opportunities and, uh, and threats and uh, sure. there are challenges I would say that uh, bo bo both, both seem to be there and uh, Indian uh, businesses um, and uh, uh, the, the, the policy makers would be conscious of uh, both the challenges and, uh, and, the, and the threats that uh, this process is. Uh, Fair enough. Fair enough. Is Mr. Sarkar, to... is that a major or a big opportunity for India here? Because all the other countries take it, uh, to, you know, the US is looking inwards, uh, the Britain is looking inwards. So, is this a major opportunity for India? It's difficult to answer at this stage because I think it's the, the picture right now is pretty sketchy, it's too hazy right now and there are a lot of things which are happening and there are a lot of pressures being built up. But I would say one thing and it's a fairly sweeping statement in fact that uh, if the FTA with EU floundered, it was basically Britain which put in a lot of objections to that uh, agreement. And so with Britain out of the way, maybe with Europe we would have a uh, better understanding and we may be able to get through uh, especially in automobiles in your uh, in your uh, uh, of course liquor also wine wine has a great future so those things are bound to happen but britain remains important for us uh, as far as let's say it is concerned and then tatas of course have a major presence over there through jaguar and steel also but there are issues within Britain itself. You see, like Nicola Stur Stur Sturgeon says that uh, she wants the Section 30 order to be uh, to be to be put in place, which means that she wants a second independence uh, referendum. The agreement with uh, Ireland may have some 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 issues because if it is not compatible with the EU laws, so then it has to go. Uh, or rather it has to be diluted to that extent. I would not say it will go, but it has to be diluted to that extent. Then there are questions like what happens to the court procedures which are in front of the Court of Justice of, uh, of the European Union? Uh, are they going to be implemented or they are going to be, uh, uh, are they, uh, or they would put a stop to the whole issue? Then is there a divorce cost? Because uh, Britain actually is committed to pay about 91 billion uh, uh, pounds sterling over the next three years. Now, would that be stopped? So that's another issue which has to be considered. But I would, uh, I would say I'd be a little optimist here because I feel that the trade deals will start around August. Not we don't have to wait for the two years, mm. which is uh, the mandatory requirement, of course. But we, uh, since the trade deals are likely to start in August and, and the Brussels meeting is taking place on April 29th, so things could uh, start moving and the picture could become a little more clearer. And when it does, I think India has everything to gain and nothing to lose because India is in a very sweet spot right now. And uh, whether it's with the EU or with Britain, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be doing uh, great business. So we are safe for the time being is what you are saying. Absolutely, we are pretty safe. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, uh, Professor Das, you know, as far as some of the sectors that are going to be impacted the most, can you list out which sectors could, could those sectors be? 
Again, it's uh, not very easy to answer that question. There are many imponderables in this entire equation. The first imponderable, of course, is uh, what will be the trade relations between UK on the one hand and the rest of the European Union on the other after the divorce gets completed. Now, if there is a free flow of goods and services between the two through an FTA, then maybe things might not change too much on the ground for Indian exporters. But if uh, there is a hard Brexit and uh, UK is unable to export to the European Union on the existing terms, then the picture might be fairly different and could be difficult as well, as well as there could be opportunities for Indian exporters. But that, again, would depend on the trade policy of UK itself. Let me give you one example. Textiles, wearing apparel sector. At the moment, Bangladesh has a significant advantage over us because of the tariff preferences which it receives from the European Union. After Brexit, it's an open question whether UK would continue to grant Bangladesh those tariff concessions. If UK reverses what European Union is doing on the tariff concessions, that could be to our advantage. Certain calculations show that we might be able to enhance our exports of uh, wearing apparel by almost $3 billion to the Europe, uh, to United Kingdom after Brexit in case uh, India and Bangladesh come to a level playing field. So that could be one area where we might see a significant advantage. One area where there are uh, optimistic expectations that things might improve after Brexit, which is unlikely to happen, is in the area of IT services. Mm. Given the fact that uh, one of the grounds for Brexit was concerns around migration, Certainly, any expectation that Brexit could lead to a mobility in Indian IT professionals to UK, that might be too overtly optimistic. So at this juncture, we will really have to wait and see, to see how the situation evolves, what are the terms and conditions under which uh, UK will continue its trading regime with the rest of the European Union, and also what is the overall orientation of UK's trade policy to rest of the world? That really, these factors would determine what sectors get impacted, sure. where are the opportunities, where are the conflicts, where are the challenges. Indeed, I guess we'll have to wait and watch and see what really happens in the next uh, uh, coming few months. Mr. Sakar, I know you want to make a point, but also I have a question for you. You know, talking about the IT industry, the IT industry stands to lose the most, would you think, because of what's happening in the United States as well with the H-1B uh, uh, visa issue as well as, uh, you know, Trump saying that uh, uh, May, Trump has been talking about made in America and jobs in America first. So does the Indian IT sector stand to lose with the situation in the United States and the situation developing in the UK now? Let me first say what is in my head. So I'll come to your question. I'll definitely come to your question. You see, the issue is that there are some indirect pinpricks which might happen because of uh, Britain leaving EU. Supposing EU, uh, uh, obviously, why, why suppose? There's bound to be a uh, agreement, a trade agreement between EU and Britain. Now, Britain can't do business with the territory of Gibraltar mm. because it has to go through the Kingdom of Spain. Now, why I took that example, not because Gibraltar is a very important area, but the fact remains is that you have to, ha there's some kind of a chaos which might take place and this will take a little bit, a little time to sort out. And uh, that's just for the information of the viewers because, yes. so these are issues which may come up which I, I hope they don't, but they, they are likely to come up also. Now, coming back to your question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, IT, as far as IT is concerned, I have a contrarian view. I think India is doing pretty well. India is very firmly entrenched. The IT industry in India is $160 billion. Directly and indirectly, we employ about 37.5 million people. And we are spreading our wings everywhere. Even in America, I don't think we have a major issue because uh, it's basically the hit is against the illegal immigrants. It's not against the skilled worker. And to that extent, I think uh, uh, India stands to gain. As far as Britain is concerned, Britain remains and it will, will remain a very important financial center. And when you have such a, a financial center cannot function without technology. 
and if you if that be the issue that be the case then obviously india will play a very major role over there because paris taking over from london is something which i mean i at least i can't foresee that uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 years london will remain important and so obviously the technology part will always remain important and india will always play a role and the most important thing today is the indian it industry is growing and it has it has in fact become it is grown up now in the sense that it is no longer a backroom boy and it has it is it has started uh, getting into areas which are at a much higher level so i i would strongly feel that india india has a great chance in it and uh, maybe there will be some uh, roadblocks on the way but over a period of 5 years i see the indian it industry doing very well both in europe as well as in britain sure yeah, fair enough yeah answer. yes yes ambassador i think that uh, you know what has happened in the uk already is that uh, uh, prime minister theresa may has uh, taken a decision to enhance the uh, minimum threshold uh, for eligibility for uh, visas you know work visas so the salary scale has been upped uh similarly in the us what has happened so far is that the um you know uh, fast track processing of h1b visas where you could actually pay uh more fees and get the processing done in 15 days or so has been done away with so now it's only normal processing which takes 3 to 6 months and the second is that the work visas for spouses uh on h1b have been uh, done away with there's legislation pending draft legislation in the congress which would make the grant of h1b visas far more difficult and which would also raise the ceiling one proposes one draft legislation proposes 100000 dollars as a minimum the other one proposes 130000 dollars as a minimum so obviously this would mean uh, that uh, to some extent the cost advantage which our companies have enjoyed will be eroded they would have to look at different models of uh, operating different ways of operating they will change with the times they will have to change and uh, see this you can also look upon it as an opportunity to do more work within india of a uh, caliber which uh, you know will take us uh, will up the game for india uh the other aspect of indian it companies in uk would be that right now they can access the european market yes. you know many of them have their headquarters in london and from there they operate in the entire european market uk is like the doorway If, to europe yeah, for indian it's companies it's a doorway to europe if that is fractured in some way they would have to look at opening offices in other parts of europe which would enable them to access europe and perhaps thinning down the uk offices Indeed. it depends how it's going to shape up yeah it depends on how it's going to shape up of mm -hmm. course but you know another sector that needs to be keenly watched uh, professor is the pharma uh, pharma sector because it's got a huge presence in europe and in uk as well so that sector do you believe is going to be impacted as a result of brexit in fact in the pharma sector i do see some opportunities arising mm -hmm. for us in the uk market particularly in the national health scheme given the concerns in uk of uh, about rising healthcare costs we might see a trend towards uh, larger government procurement of generics from india and if we position ourselves appropriately we might be able to tap into this uh, growing market so that is one area where there would be benefits linked to that is of course affordable healthcare if we look at the existing rules of the european union the insurance companies are able to bear the costs if the flights are within a particular time limit that excludes patients from coming to india maybe these rules might change after brexit these rules might change in uk they might change in european union as well and if that does happen then that would afford immense opportunity for healthcare providers in india so that's an area where we must position ourselves appropriately we must be prepared for the opportunities that could arise yeah. prepare and get ready is is the general consensus here and we need to innovate and you know need to change with the times but let's move on now uh, mr dash you know as far as uh, 
the situation in the United States and after Trump winning and also after the Brexit clause was triggered, we saw last year that uh, several of the investors turning to gold. Now, is that a trend that is going to continue where investors look to invest in gold going forward? No, I, I, I don't see that, uh, uh, you know, why, why that should be particularly uh, investors should be turning to gold. I do not see a link anywhere. Okay. Fair enough. You know, uh, let's talk about some of the sectors now, uh, Mr. Sarkar, as far as, uh, you know, where there could be further opportunities. Now, the travel sector as well as uh, the tourism sector is, is a sector that could possibly work for Indians because the, the sterling has been depreciating over the last one year. We've seen that the sterling has been doing badly. So it's going to be cheaper for tourists to go to, uh, to the UK if you, if you look at it that way. Yes, I mean, before I, again, before I, I come to your question, you see, what is happening today is that the emerging uh, country uh, nations are gaining in importance. Despite Fed Reserve increasing the rate, there's still money which is flowing into the emerging nations, which means that the emerging nations by itself, and of course, India should be at the forefront, is, is going to economically uh, going to move up. And once that happens, obviously the per capita income is going to go up. And once and when when the, uh, that in turn means that I will have some money to travel, and Europe will obviously be a very very important place for me to travel, and uh, not to forget Bollywood because Bollywood also would have a lot of lot of uh, things to do in Europe. So it's a combination of those things, and travel will obviously be a very very important factor, so even in Scandinavian countries. Even uh, I mean I mean once you get the gateway. So you're going to travel all over Europe, and uh, 27 countries are part of EU. There are others also who are equally important. So, so the travel to Europe will become fairly important. Britain has always been a, some kind of a second home for us in the sense that um, most of the, us who have gone abroad have possibly gone to UK as maybe as the first country, or at least they have gone there. So, so, so if you if you take all that into account, so I think we're going to be do, do uh, travel will have a very important role to play. Now coming to automobiles, I think automobiles from the European automobiles, we haven't had a very great uh, exposure to European uh, uh, cars, despite the fact that we know a Mercedes, we know an Audi, we know what is uh, a BMW. A BMW or, yes. or, but because of the very obscene customs duty, which is, which, is, which is slapped on them, is that we haven't had a good look at these cars, which obviously are, uh, according to me, are much better than, let's say, a Korean car. So, so, so those cars will come to us at a cheaper rate. And with GST now coming in, GST has one advantage as far as luxury cars are concerned, is that there'll be at least something like 4 to 12% uh, uh, price revision downwards because of the GST uh, uh, peaking at 28% and then they have the cess. So everything combined, it'll be, it'll be a great thing that we'll get and of course, not to forget wine. You see, wine and perfumes, of course. So these are factors. These are things which are a little out of my uh, uh, horizon. The sense that I am not able to lay my hands on them because they are too costly for me. Not because they are of uh, the manufacturing cost happens to be high, but but because of the, uh, the uh, across the border taxes, Indeed. which which happens. Indeed. Just yes. Yes. Your... Uh, Ambassador, I mean, these are this, this, this as well, and I, want, and I want to ask you another question as well, uh, you know, the about the education that, sector. Uh, Mr. Sarkar has been talking of are basically those which would come into play if there is an India-EU FTA, mm -hmm. which still is under negotiation, yes. it's not yet moved. Um, and I think from the Indian side in that FDA, the linkage was to a regime for visas which would enable our software services to be delivered in Europe more easily. Now, if there is a protectionist and you know, anti-immigrant sentiment which makes visas more difficult, I think the FTA negotiations are going to be difficult to move along because that's the one sector where India has substantial cost competitiveness. Sure. And uh, the same thing about travel to the UK, that if the visas for Indians, because the UK deals very differently with Chinese nationals and Indian nationals for purposes of visas, uh, their visa policy has become very stringent. 
then Indians are not going to go to the UK whether the pound is cheaper or not. Fair because enough. the UK will deny them the opportunity to go. Indeed, fair enough. You know, uh, quick comments from both my uh, guests now on the panel uh, because I'm, I'm running out of time. Professor, as far as the education sector is concerned, because the UK is a much sought after uh, you know, destination for Indian students, how is Brexit going to impact the students and the education sector? If Brexit leads to reduction in costs for the Indian students, then certainly it will do a world of good to all those who aspire to study in the UK. As at this juncture, I'm afraid the costs for non-EU nationals are very high in the United Kingdom. That has to change. No, but that, that is bound to change, isn't it? Because they have some subsidies for you know, EU nationals at the moment and they also have some seats reserved for these EU nationals. That might not continue. Exactly. So that's part of the imponderable in the future. If that changes, well and good for our students. If it doesn't, then unfortunately it will not create new opportunities for us. Okay, you fair know, enough. Right now, the fact that Indian students, uh, foreign students, non-EU students were allowed to work earlier for two years, that has been done away with. So that has made it rather unattractive sure. to go to the UK and the number of students going to the UK has actually come down. They prefer to go to Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Canada, yes. Uh, these will be the choices and both to the US and UK you will see perhaps a decline in the number of Fair students. Fair enough. Mr. Dash, your closing comments on the program. Please conclude the show for us with your closing remarks. Uh, you know, I would uh, quite agree with uh, Ambassador Sankar uh, saying that you see much will depend on uh, what uh, uh, India is able to uh, negotiate separately now with uh, UK and uh, with the rest of the European Union. Now, uh, this process, uh, you know, you know, I'm sure consultations would can start uh, immediately, but formal negotiations would take place uh, only in 2019. That's the time uh, when uh, we'll be in election mode in March 2019. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, it's not uh, uh, y y unidirectional uh, relationship it, it is or, or, or a single point uh, you know um, a deal breaker that uh, one could see although uh, immigration issues are important you know free movement of professional uh, professionals for instance are very important both in the context sure. of India's negotiation with European Union and with UK separately and as we know, UK has uh, been a stumbling block in uh, not uh, uh, the FTA with European Union not happening for 10 years now, despite uh, the talks going on. And, uh, you know, Prime Minister May herself as uh, Home Secretary hasn't contributed to this process uh, because, because of the restrictive visa policies. So, uh, uh, given, given this kind of... Uh, thing on both sides, immigration is an important issue, but it is not something that uh, that will, that, that will, that's a deal breaker in that sense, right. both in negotiation with, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European Union and uh, UK. All right, on that note, we'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Meera Shankar, SK Sarkar, Abhijit Das and Priya Ranjan Dash, thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time.